complexities of modern technology and the accelerated speed of our lives simplify the world of our existence. Expediency and our obsession with objective knowledge, coupled with our increasing technological worldview, has become central to a split between perceiver and perceived. Rarely in our mo modern metropolitan consumer cultures are we drawn into things, open to sincere connections between ourselves and the world around us. It is the poetic artifact, be this architecture, art, poetry, or narrative, which are capable of intriguing a participation with perception, intertwining thought, sense, memory, and imagination. And however rare this is becoming, the poetic creation and its involvement with memory and imagination remains essential for architectural creation on road to genuine meaning. To preserve the role of this creation, it is necessary to distinguish it from products of purely conceptual emphasis, which exist beyond the knowledge of our bodies and are transcribed to the world via abstract information. By investigating the phenomenological relationship between memory and imagination via consciousness itself, we realize that in the moment between a raw experience and the objective determination which follows, there is a vital participation with perception which occurs between us and things, a current which transcends objective analysis and which needs to be explored for any art which queries, as Kakuzo Okokura suggests, the virility of art and life which lay in its possibilities for growth. In the age of scientism, where outcomes are more and more determined by non-sensual formulas, it's of dire necessity that the creation at hand and its involvement with memory and imagination be maintained as to provide the possibility of an opening to poetic meaning. The artifacts of interest to this essay are dramatically different than products of objective analysis and mathematical application, which by their very premise are distanced from sense knowledge. The positivist idea for getting beyond doubt by straining the central knowledge from our pursuits emphasizes conceptual attitudes and objective analysis as the most valuable form of knowledge. Providing useful and efficient information, they reduce experiential meaning in architecture to conceptual application via aesthetic methodology, typological analysis, or other methods of systematization via direct and literal application. But these, however, miss the point when it comes pro to provocative and imaginative design. Evidence of this exists in architectural practice worldwide, where students and practitioners alike have no problem applying objective information to the design of a building that base design decisions on abstract application or which advance design via isotropic depiction or perspectival projection, but whom are more and more perplexed when you ask them to describe the experience of a space, its tangible and sensual meaning, its metaphorical or imaginative dimension. These approaches miss the intrinsic engagement, the intertwining of memory and imagination, body and world. And I think this failure to connect with experience is evidenced in the wealth of efficient products required for our modern lives our environments and mindsets where the principles of mathematical thought prevail, even where Martin Heidegger suggests there is no need of numbers, at least not in every vocation and, and all the time. Maurice Merleau-Ponty reminds us, however, that no form of objective analysis is capable of expressing the very peculiar way that perceptual consciousness constitutes its object, which instead substitutes or levels phenomena to data, treating the world as an exterior and remaining unconcerned with how we constitute the subject internally. The way that we see, hear, or feel is obviously substituted with what we ought to see objectively. So this act of dualism cuts out our bodies and allows the world to be seen as something outside ourselves, something easily reduced to a formulaic system, something to be manipulated or answered in a, an efficient mode. So in this way, our creations more and more become separated from perception as a, as a vital source of meaning. The artifacts of interest to this essay are rather the precipitates of a complete perception, which explore the interwoven realities of space, material, body, and context necessary for real meaning. This availing to experience seems necessary for emerging of creation and environment, thought and feeling in our contemporary milieu, and may help reestablish a confidence in our sensed knowledge. A drawing, a model, sculpture, or sketch, this tangible creation in front of us, born through a tactile and perceptual involvement, engages active interpretation and moves us to an inquiry that touches the innate intertwining of the body and our world. These gain direction from the relationship between the perceiving subject and the world and then, of course, the thing created, which is what's of importance here. For example, in a recently completed term abroad program in Barcelona, Spain, students were asked to immerse themselves in the culture of Barcelona in order to prolong or protract the process of inquiry and to avoid a reductive rush to objective design solutions. They became familiar with the people, customs, and culture, were encouraged to form relationships with the place and its life, and to use these to instigate their design. Students became immersed in the locale and were 
has to experientially map everything from the texture of the city to its immediate experience of people moving down its streets. The experiences were then translated into the fictional narrative of Citizen X, becoming a collection known as Xavier's Autobiography. They used their own experiences in this way to relive or imagine a person, a life born from a pair of shoes found. We could, yeah, do a slide. Unless you've already skipped them. I don't have any. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, okay. That's fine. They used their own experiences to relive and imagine this person, a life born from a pair of shoes found. The goal was to fill these shoes with stories that brush up against the life that is lived there. X became a way to engage interpretation by going the history, the experience of Barcelona, into a story which, like music, poetry, or film, helps us to imagine through. These were then translated into artifacts that helped to steer the architectural investigation. Born from memory and imagination in relation to experience, these things provoke student interpretation based on and in this context. Everything from the winding streets, the density of the city, its materiality, juxtaposed with the expanse of the sea and the energetic nightlife, had soaked into the flesh of the students, helping to inspire the artifacts created. Their very texture and essence. Symbolically, X became a narrative map, a mode of investigation, or a poetic vessel that the group could draw upon for, for future inspiration. From rubbings of the city and packs which presented the textures and folding qualities of the streets and the labyrinthine nature of travel itself, to film and other mapping exercises, these demonstrate an engagement born from the place itself and the life that's lived there. In another way, X becomes a way of testing design decisions through things created, from the situation and perspective of the perceiver. Questions of how a design could be perceived from various perspectives helps to engage the empathetic involvement with these experiences inducing a more substantial involvement with creation, demanding an intense participation with perception, which reminds us that it is actually human interaction itself that makes design meaningful. In a similar way, other projects like a tea house project, which requires students to interpret the rituals of the Japanese tea ceremony, in inspired by the Book of Tea by Kakuzo Okakura, in terms of their immediate context, um, being Fargo, North Dakota, has led some very interesting interpretations, or the Music House Project, which we don't see here, but we use our imagination, <laughs> or the Twin House Project, which queries design by, um, through things like a particular song, interests, livelihood, and relationships of particular clients, which help to engage a distance that these students must reconcile into design through their imagination and through themselves. These help to engage a currency of knowledge only made possible in the, by embodied experience, memory, and imagination in an empathetic involvement with life and how it is lived. Creations made before, during, or after a project are helpful in drawing the creator and attendee into the design and serve as valuable examples of this engagement. Creations as wide ranging as, again, a teacup, if you can imagine it, for the tea house design, which warms with the sun as it moves throughout the day, or as carved to reflect the process of refining the tea leaves to a stretching bar for a dance studio which folds and stretches like its inhabitants, to a piece of furniture or a phone or other artistic analogs which helps designers and attendees alike to better relate to and test the experiential dimension of hypothetical concepts. Creations approached in this way are not dependent on individual variables or discursive texts that can be manipulated towards distinct objectives because the artifact is dependent upon the entire perceptual field to form its meaning. These rather exercise, exercise thought by inscribing into reality. The artifact in turn anchors this to a point that we all can relate to, our sensual being, our commonalities of flesh and space, cultural understanding and time. This act of interpretation is made possible only via an immediate appeal to perception, a one-to-one -one direct transmission through experience, which casts the artifact in an irreducible and poetic light. It is important to realize that the thing that most differentiates these artifacts from products of objective origins is recon recognizing that all that we know and all that we could possibly know are present in the immediate perception of the things themselves and not in an abstract or conceptual substitution of them. <clears throat> the primary engagement with our embodied consciousness is most clearly <coughs> illustrated when we consider even the most commonplace encounters and experience. For example, when we're caught up in the activity of daydreaming, remembering anything from a past family pet to the dinner we had last week or last night, we re realize that everything remembered necessarily demands an imaginative act in, re in its recollection, and that this is reciprocal and only made possible in relation to phenomena. Memories themselves never appear as objective recounts retrieved with factual precision, but are a blend of memory and imagination dependent upon immediate perception. Vice versa, imagination is never devoid of memory, which directs the sensation of the imagined. 
Paradoxically, I think this demonstrates that the recollection of phenomena are not only born through our surroundings in perception, but are also directed towards phenomena through the imagination. We thrust it into the world and test it against its immediate texture. From the presence of a cup, for example, we are reminded simultaneously of its contents and imagine and remember the last drink and the future beverage simultaneously. It is through the things themselves that we realize that we can make sense of the world only by referencing knowledge in relation to the world, which simultaneously re reveals this perceived world as the soil for imaginative growth and the foundation for its meaning. This meaning itself seems a current that grows from memory and imagination inward and outward, simultaneously from immediate perception. As Merleau-Ponty suggests, we are in the world as the heart is in the organism. Here, he states, we gather the imminent significance in perception, without which no memory is possible, and we thrust deeply into the horizon of the past until the experiences which it epitomizes are as if relived in their temporal setting. In this activity, we recognize that to imagine or remember is always to make something appear in the present, to give a magical quasi-presence to an object that is not there, an absent visage in the present data of perception. In every situation, there is more there than what is objectively seen. <clears throat> we create the world as we move through it. We are part of it. Our memory and imagination is coalesced with the world, out, drifting through some uh, phenomena, determining and symbolizing constantly. The artifact helps steer this interaction, which procures an irreducible series of significations crucial for architectural inquiry. In the studio, we find the hand in relation to its craft, in relation to a length of wood sanded to fit another piece of wood of a different size, color, and grain, which allows the texture, the weight, and material of this jointing to become the prerequisites of a future meaning. The act and purpose of this placement inherently reference all that we have known of the project and all that it must do, its relation to the adjacent building, the potential reflections it may make, the plane it will hold up, which calls into account a coalescence of memory and imagination which spans the gamut of the project's bearing, its inspiration, situation, and meaning. In the model, we can imagine the way that one would move through it. Its significance is determined by the memory recalled in relation to its intentions and programmatic aims, which is all called by perception through this assembly into question. Like tent poles that secure a space out of sheets, the artifact holds open the potential meaning against, gauged against our knowledge itself. Any element of its composition could reveal itself as more appropriate with a particular, particular adjustment, but would not have been noticed until this point. This provides the capability to unlock various aberrations that reveal themselves in relation to the things at hand, which can never appear to a formulaic or conceptual methodology. In this way, perception feels itself rather than sees itself, searches after clarity rather than possesses it, and which creates truth rather than finds it an invaluable part of the perceptual current essential to interpretation, it calls into question the certainty of linear methods and displays the pursuit of a good ambiguity and an imaginative engagement necessary for our highest vocation. I think we need to actually embrace this ambiguity and kind of say we need a bit of confusion in things so that we can break the kind of objective code that we've become accustomed and in this way kind of engage bodily questioning the meaning of this intertwined relationship between memory and imagination is dependent upon the bonding between the depth of our bodies and space itself. And this is a depth that is not reducible to the Cartesian third dimension. As Merleau-Ponty suggests, we recognize this, that this depth is necessarily the first, because from, the, from birth we merge the mind, body, and world in corporal depth our whole life and are never separated from it. When we hover too long above a model, we can never imagine the way it would be perceived from the perspective of its inhabitant. Or if we create formal manipulations via computer application, we reduce this depth of the imagination to a glowing surface. On the computer, we can never haunt the space between us and things in the same way. Artifacts in real depth seduce our attention and approximate all relations because we are somehow coordinated through them. When we position a piece of wood or we draw a mark, this attention is reflected in our entire being. The body, its movement, and conscious reflection are swathed together, enveloped with each other, and capable of steering the imagination itself. It was this method of interaction between the body and its environment in those initial rubbings, which we didn't actually see, but which immediately set the body to work interpreting relations via a tactile engagement. And it is this currency between the memories of the body and the imagined potential of creation that becomes what has been called a hinge of knowledge itself. And in this way, the artifact allows the knowledge of the entire body to flow through it. It, like the body, 
becomes an instrument for the imagination, an extension and source of orientation with regards to its meaning. So in so doing, this extension of ourselves becomes possible because as Merleau-Ponty reminds us, the body is somehow the locus of all formulations about the world. Every sensation that we've learned or can even imagine forms a reference for its meaning through our bodies. This corporeal sensitivity garnered from previous experience, both physical and magic, holds and releases the sum of all constitutions, all of our knowledge in an aura of poetic relations. Metaphorical too, because all that is known or is possibly known is either like or unlike a previous experience of a similar or different kind. And at the same time, it's poetic. And it's poetic because it's new. It's always a, a, an opening. So here is the orientation for our productions, the recognition of a particular essence, the choice of this or that quality, determined by the memory in relation to the appropriate and imagined outcome. The texture, material, slant, or curve, and how this opens to another space in a design exists here and through this imaginative pondering between creation and creator. However, as Maurice Merleau-Ponty suggests, left to itself, perception forgets itself, and we're ignorant of its own accomplishments. We tend to distrust our perceptual activity and substitute this knowledge for abstract aptitudes and conceptual thinking. We are inevitably pulled away from the involvement of memory and imagination by the objective constructs we've inherited via positivist systematization. And while memory and imagination reside permanently and indistinguishably at, with consciousness as its steering agents, the full contribution of their involvement is, as Martin Heidegger suggests, stifled, concealed, or parted against in our modern lives. Hence, the greatest charge of the artifact of architecture itself is its ability to open an involvement with perception, challenging the amalgamation of imagination and memory to surface, permeate, and congeal with phenomena, inspiring a poetic wonder. The artifact, like a window, simultaneously opens and frames a view to something beyond. Its work pulls our perception into action by breaking the objective code to which we've become accustomed. In resounding with sense, it naturally inspires the attendee to hunt for and find a meaning for themselves. These creations open us to the world, soaking perception with memory and persuading our imagination to leap. Like all poetry, it provides a new way of seeing a piece of the world, thereby adding to our knowledge of it. It is here that we realize that phenomenological investigations reveal that powerful design is not achieved by thinking or applying a concept from afar, but in the immediate moment, open between us and the thing created, one that we can imagine through and which determines its future. Thank you. I apologize for the no problem. lack of uh, images. We had a technological problem at the beginning which erased everything. No problem. Um, we're going to now finish with Frank Weiner. Weiner. Frank Weiner. Um, going back to a uh, uh, specific building study here. The space under La Tourette, a marriage of phantasm and contour. And then after, after Frank, we will then take the group questions starting all the way from the first presentation from the top. Okay. Yeah. This one. Who's on? Japan. Sakamoto Tashi. No, I'm not doing it. Okay. 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 trying to sense what it may evoke, uh, and in particular the comb-like piloti uh, under La Tourette. And you can keep that up for a while. Okay. Um, I want to read you a short excerpt from a letter that Madame Savoy wrote to Corbusier in 1937 uh, that I think is relevant to the questions of habitability and, and uninhabitability in architecture. And, uh, and it goes this way. And this is a letter directly to Corbusier. After innumerable demands on my part, you have finally accepted that this house, which you built in 1929, is uninhabitable. 
Your responsibility is at stake, and I have no need to foot the bill. Please render it habitable immediately. I sincerely hope that I will not have to take recourse to legal action. Uh, they didn't end up in court because uh, World War II uh, created, let's say, a major uh, distraction in that process, and, and they had to flee that house. But I think that letter uh, is very telling about what, just what a, a, a professional is responsible for, or what a client thinks we're responsible for. For instance, a patient might demand that their doctor make them healthy, or a client that their lawyer free them from incarceration, and that an architect make their house habitable. I just wonder how reasonable these demands are. Perhaps the degree to which we might inhabit architecture, or that architecture can be inhabited at all, has been vastly overestimated. <laughs> Habitation is not a given in architecture. Uh, Madame Savoy's concern under, uh, about the habitability of her house underscores not only an ontological, but a phenomenological difference between an architect and a client. Despite Madame Savoy's admonition, architecture is limited in its capacity to be inhabited and uninhabitable spaces are necessary to guarantee the existence of architecture. Uh, I believe that habitation presupposes function, and the ground of habitation is the uninhabitable. It's, it's no small realization that phenomenology is the philosophy of inhabitation. For, for Bachelard, we learn that uninhabitable spaces support the portion of architecture lodged between garret and cellar that we habitually deem habitable. Only a small part of architecture is habitable. Furnishings and fittings may in fact play a greater role towards inhabitation than the elements of architecture themselves. Just what part of architecture is habitable is very difficult to determine. This observation can be disconcerting or perhaps get us closer to the nature of what I would call architecture's poetic evasion of inhabitation. One should never try to understand every word in a poem, nor make every space in a building usable. To do so would be to squeeze out the irrational out of consideration. Such efficiency is a ruse upon which almost the entire edifice of functionalism uh, may rest. The irrational space under La Tourette seems to be, in my mind, one of the best spaces from which to address some of these issues that I would collect under the phrase, the fallacy of inhabitation. Another set of considerations has to do with the pilotes themselves and the significance of Le Corbusier's five points of architecture, or what I would uh, prefer to call the five points of habitation. The existence of the diversity of pilotes encountered uh, at La Tourette, especially the comb-like pilotes, which I'll show you in a few moments, seems to be one of Corbusier's finest unguarded moments. Their expression may, in part, be related to the themes of the voluptuous erotic feminine taken up in his, in his paintings and drawings that he habitually undertook across his life as an architect. In the comb-like pelotes, one can read the open hand turned upside down and the comb of a rooster or chanticleer that appears in the tales of Chaucer and the fables of Aesop. There is also the feeling of the maternal earth mother. The comb evokes not the cosmetic, but rather the anatomic and the acoustic. Here, the vocable chant or crow of the rooster can be a play on the pseudonym Le Corbusier from the Gens des Corbus, or People of the Crows. One cannot be definitive in their interpretations of the totemic piloti, that's a word that, that Corbusier used, but rather accept them as lusty evocations and, and even perhaps surreal forms. I think that the space under La Tourette is as close as an architect has ever come to making the feeling of the surreal, um, such as you might experience in reading a novel called Paris Peasant by uh, Louis Aragon. The surreal is an appetite, or one might say habit, for images of the unwanted, of the discarded, and the unseemly. A surrealist is a drinker of stupefacient images, where the senses become eroticized to the point of nullification. The space under La Tourette is, by Le Corbusier's own admission, a result of the top-down design from the parapet as an artificial horizon to the subsequent lifting up of the building poised above a slope, sloping and highly evasive site. To place the majority of the building, of the body of the building, in or on the ground would have been a move that, it would, have, that would have allowed the site to swallow up the form. 
The pilotis are form givers in the sense that they allow the building from above to be read as form by, inserted, by inserting an uninhabitable airspace between the earth and the architecture above. The building is in a sense alienated by design. There exists a datum or horizon between architecture and engineering, the infrastructure of the pilotis below and the structure of the architecture above. And now I'd just like to go through a series of images. Yeah. <coughs> this point I think is quite intriguing where it's about three or four feet off the ground so it's a, it's a point where you can touch the building and then there's a and then the site slopes away from that. Next. This is a, a piece of wallpaper in a space when Corbusier was working on a book called The Home of Man. And uh, he referred, to, he loved this image because he t talked about the lusty evocations of this particular image. about how to make these openings. Next. And there's where it's referred to as a comb. This is right here. Okay. These are occurring where the atrium in the building uh, is. It's a fairly complicated space in, in the center of Altera. Uh, next one. They took a series of pri uh, site profiles, and that's how really they determined how much space they had between under the building and where the, where the contours were. These are dark because the, the images in the, in the books are tough to see. But it's really handled in section rather than plan. Next one. Next. We have a famous diagram of kind of diagonal intersection of architecture and engineering, which I think is very much happening at La Tourette. Next An early sketch of this below the under the atrium. 
some drawings, uh, works on paper that Corbusier did in the late 40s that might provide some clues and some of the areas of the drawings you might look at are these hands intersected by a line. You can also read them as in sometimes interconnected. Next. The detail. Next one. So you get the feeling with these piloti that there might be a, an opposite form coming up from under the ground, possibly. Thanks. <laughs> this kind of the piloti up here. <laughs> <laughs> that one I can't prove. <laughs> it's a children's story. There's a rooster if you've never seen one. If you live in the city, you might not see a postcard from Monterey. Next. Some recent photos taken by Professor Larry Dahl of the University of Texas that helped me study this space. It's now under construction, under renovation. Next. It's a space that's difficult to traverse. It's not easy to move around that space. interesting. This is maybe one precursor, which was a, a, one of the unité, the Habitation projects, in which he removed some material under a stair. And I think that freedom opened up a kind of a new exploration, formal exploration for what you see. One of the early sketches that Courbusier made when he visited La Tourette. And a very, very that image, that's the last image, and I'll just conclude with a few remarks. A very famous photograph taken by René Bury, who was one of the few photographers, photographers that Corbusier sort of led into his, his life, into his personal sphere. And uh, I was going to Photoshop this so that Corbusier's finger was touching the pillow to but <laughs> <laughs> that would be a lie. You know? and what's so nice is he's pointing to himself. <laughs> but he's just a couple of inches from giving us the secret I think of, of the piloti. Hmm. Let me just end with a few thoughts, very brief. 